Take your Bibles and turn to 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. We're going to return to verses 12 through 14 this morning. 1 John chapter 2, 12 through 14. This is now the word of God. I am writing to you, little children, because your sins have been forgiven you for his name's sake. I am writing to you, fathers, because you know him who has been from the beginning. I am writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I have written to you, children, because you know the Father. I have written to you, fathers, because you know him who has been from the beginning. I have written to you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the evil one. Let's pray. Father, we come before you this morning for the purpose of worship. We never want to lose sight of why we're here. We don't gather here so much for our benefit, even our enjoyment or our blessing, though we greatly benefit and we greatly enjoy this, and it is a blessing. We gather here, Father, for the purpose of exalting your name. We come to bring you worship, to sing, to ponder who you are, to meditate upon your very being, to study your word that we might know of you even better, to yield our lives into subjection to your word. Father, we come here to exalt you and to praise you. This is a worship service. And Lord God, it is our prayer that you are exalted, that you are glorified, that you are worshiped, that there is but one in this place that receives glory before this is over. And God, we pray that it is you. We love you and we are thankful for who you are. Just your very essence, your very being is mind-boggling to us. I cannot comprehend or wrap my mind around the fullness of your attributes and how they all work in such perfect harmony together. When we fail and fall so short in all of those areas, you are perfectly holy and yet perfectly merciful. You are just and right and yet also gracious and merciful and loving. Father, we don't comprehend how you can be so perfect in all your ways, and yet you are, and we praise you for that. When we contemplate the things that you do, Lord, you can do what no one can do. There is none like you. You alone can save. You alone hold the power of creation. You alone, God, can do these things, and we're in awe of you for that, and we worship you for that. And God, we thank you even specifically for the fact that in your great love you sent your Son to redeem us. We did not deserve it, and indeed we still don't, and yet you have saved us, and we praise you, so we come to honor you. We study your word this morning, God, and we are dependent that your spirit grant us understanding, and we trust that he will, as he is faithful to do, and we pray that the end result is that you are glorified. We ask it in Jesus' name, amen. We started looking at these passages last week, and as I told you, it was my full intention to get through all of them last week, but I really got hung up a little bit. Uh, just on verse 12, in which John said, I'm writing to you, little children, because your sins have been forgiven you for his name's sake. It's a really remarkable thing to contemplate forgiveness, to not just read over it or not to let it become routine or mundane, as sometimes I think those things happen to us who are familiar with the lingo, but to stop and contemplate the reality that what I have done and even what I will do has been forgiven thanks to Christ. But also the added effect which John gives us is to understand that it has been forgiven for his name's sake. To rightly focus the glory that God did this for himself, that he did this for Christ. It is for the glory of Christ, for the glory of God. And that also, by the way, is extremely remarkable. None of us wants to read in the scripture that we are forgiven because we deserved it or forgiven for our own benefit. For certainly you or I might fall out of good graces. You or I might do something that would no longer render us worthy of the benefit. He's not saving us because we deserve it. He's not saving us because we are sort of maintaining his favor. What he is doing is doing for his glory. A holy God is taking sinful men and saving them in spite of what they are, so that sinful men will surround his throne and glorify him for all eternity. And that he will never let up on. It is a glorious thing to know we are forgiven for his sake. But because we stopped at verse 12, I think it probably left us a little confused on what the passage as a whole means. I told you last time we called this sermon for the church at war. 
The church is always at war. We battle not against flesh and blood, but against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. And the purpose of these three verses is to encourage that church which is at war. It is to encourage those soldiers. It is to encourage those who go out and fight battles, those who are shell-shocked because of the constant mortar drops around them, those who need to maybe even at times be lifted back into a role to encourage and to lift up the troops. John is writing to a church who has been bombarded, bombarded with deception. There's no doubt there has been an evil mission at hand. In John's day, it was Gnosticism, but it's always something new. And each and every day, Satan attacks in various ways. John has already used several times the word liar, the word deceived. He's talking about that enemy that has infiltrated the church and is literally dropping mortar shells all around. Bombs of deception, lies, things that would rattle and confuse and unsettle the saints things that would make weary the soldiers who are constantly fighting the battle. And John is writing this letter to that church who has been bombarded that they might be uplifted, encouraged, and to understand their current role in the war. Already several times, John has called out people as liars. Those who say they have fellowship with God but walk in darkness, John said they're a liar. Those who say they know Christ but don't obey him, John said they're lying. He's already talked about those who are deceived, Those who say they have no sin, John said they've lied to themselves. Those who say they have not sinned, not only are they lying, but they make God out to be a liar. Those who say they're in Christ, but they hate their brother, John says there's no truth in them. They're deceived. And we talked about then this distortion that's come upon the church and how detrimental it is. These Gnostics and these people with this view that sin is not the problem, but rather maybe a lack of knowledge is the problem, and they've turned the gospel on its head, There's all sorts of casualties to that. Anytime there's a war, when you drop a bomb, there are casualties. There are professional casualties, which would be the soldiers. There are civilian casualties. Sometimes it's children. Sometimes it's women. Sometimes it's the elderly. Sometimes it's the soldiers. And that that is also true in the church. When the enemy drops his bombs of deception, casualties are everywhere. On one hand, we would say certainly the lost are a casualty. You distort the gospel and the lost don't get saved. They can't hear without a preacher. They can't call on him whom they've not believed. They have to hear the gospel. And if they're hearing some aberration, some distortion of the gospel, they're not going to be saved. They're a casualty of this type of war, as we talked about last time. But so are the church. People in the church are a casualty of such deception. It doesn't rob them of their salvation. Salvation is secure because of the ongoing work of Christ. But it can rob them of their assurance. When someone comes in and preaches a false gospel and distorts what is true, it can cause even believers to question, do I believe right? Am I right? Am I saved? Uh, All throughout the letter of Galatians, when the issue was legalism and circumcision, Paul used the word, those who are unsettling you, those who are disturbing you, those who are shaking you out of your composure, Paul would say. That happens when the gospel is distorted, and certainly this church John is writing to is a casualty of that. But even as we saw last time, even Christ is a casualty when the gospel is distorted. Not that he's in danger of being dethroned, not that he's in danger of not returning, not that he's in danger of any sense like that, but he does lose glory. The gospel is all about the glory of Christ. The gospel focuses to what he did and what he's doing so that all nations, every tribe and tongue glorify and praise him. And when the gospel is distorted, it takes the focus off of Christ. And so glory is lost. John then is on a mission here in 1 John to restore. He's on a mission for this church at war to help them not only expose those who maybe have false assurance who are lost and don't know it, but to comfort those who are saved and don't enjoy it and also to make sure that Christ is glorified. That helps us to understand a little bit the direct nature of why John is writing. I think you would all agree John has been very direct, very bold. It's not hard to see how Jesus one time called him a son of thunder. Because John is direct. He writes specific. He writes simple. He writes in a way that you can't miss it. You don't get around statements like, if somebody says they know God but don't obey him, they're a liar. That, that's pretty bold. That's pretty direct. Someone might well ask the question, John, why so bold? Why so direct? Why so black and white? I mean, you're, you're really, John came out of the gate swinging here. He's drawn a line in the sand, kind of like we envision at the Alamo, and he's pretty much said, this is it, right? I mean, this is the line, and he won't blur it, 
And he won't make exceptions. John's black and white. He, he doesn't see in gray. At least it doesn't appear he does in First John. And some people have difficulty with such abruptness, such harshness. John, why so abrupt? Why so direct? Well, he doesn't state that question here in chapter 2. But I think he tells you exactly that that is the question he's answering. In fact, in verses 12 to 14, I've told you in those three verses, six times you see the same phrase. I am writing to you because. I am writing to you because. I have written to you because. It's though John is almost saying, I hope you don't think it's strange that I am writing to you such a direct and bold and abrupt letter. But here's why I'm doing it. And that's what we want to look at. We saw the first two points last week. I'll hit them, to, hit them again quickly for you. First, John is being so bold for the sake of corporate assurance. He says in verse 12, I'm writing to you little children because your sins have been forgiven you. Sometimes, even in ministry, lines get blurred. Sometimes preachers do it. Sometimes we do it. You take someone, for example, take an analogy from John. Someone who walks in darkness someone who doesn't obey Christ, someone who has hatred for his brother, and they would come up and say, so are you saying I'm not saved? Are you saying I'm lost, John, because I hate my brother, or I'm lost because I don't obey Christ, or I'm lost because I walk in darkness? Is that what you're saying? And when you get faced with such abrupt decisions, sometimes the temptation is to sort of try to soften the edges, isn't it? The temptation is sort of try to blur the lines. Well... You know, I, I wouldn't go so far as to say I think you're lost. You, you understand that type of language. We do that with people. John's not doing that. Why? Because when you blur those lines, you don't just do it what you perceive to be for the benefit of the person who is the offender. What's happening when you blur the line? You've just taken a person who has given evidence that they are not saved. Why? Because they hate their brother, they don't obey Christ, and they walk in darkness. John made that clear. And you chose instead to blur the lines. Did you help them? No, you didn't help them. You, you released the tension between you and them, but you didn't help them. You helped yourself. But not only does it hurt them, the lost person, it also hurts the believer who's sitting over here, who thought they were saved, but now they're not sure what salvation is because we've blurred the line over here. And now, well, I thought it was my salvation that caused me to love my brother. I thought it was my salvation that caused me to walk in light. I thought it was my salvation that caused me to obey Christ. But you just said those aren't definitive fruit of salvation so what if i'm not saved you see the problem with being blurry about black and white and clear concrete truth sometimes we do that john won't john wants you to know if you're saved he wants you to know it and he wants you to enjoy it he wants you to know you are forgiven and so john says one of the reasons i write so definitive so black and white is because little children I want you to know if you're forgiven. I don't want you to walk out of this place going, I just don't know if I'm saved or not. I realize it might be uncomfortable if you find out you're not saved, but better to know it. I don't want you confused about this. And I remind you again, little children is a distinguished term from later on when John talks about children in verse uh, 13. The children there is a different word from little children in verse 12. And it's important for you to know that because in verse 13, John is speaking to a specific group. But in verse 12, he's speaking to all of us. We are all little children in that sense. We are all disciples of Christ, children of the Father. And so John simply says this, I'm writing because I want corporate assurance. I want all of those who are redeemed to know they have been totally, eternally forgiven. I want you to know that. That's why I write so bold. I don't want to leave it up to confusion. I don't want you to not know what I meant. I want you to know if you're forgiven. The second reason we talked about last time is for clarified worship. John says in verse 12 that I'm writing to you, little children, because your sins have been forgiven you for his name's sake. I'm writing because I want Christ to be glorified. I'm writing because I want him to receive the honor. I want you to know you're saved, and I want you to know why you're saved. I don't want you to think you're forgiven because you did this or because you did that or because you attended church or because you walked an aisle or because you prayed a prayer or because you got baptized. I, I don't want you to think you were saved because God just couldn't handle heaven without you. I want you to know you're saved for the glory of Christ and you're saved by the work of Christ. And so John says, I'm going to put it out there clearly. 
black and white. I don't want any confusion on this. Uh, we may be you know, liberal about some ideas. We may be non-dogmatic about some issues. Certainly, some people read two passages differently, and there's, there's charity and there's grace in our understanding and interpretation of some doctrines. I think we can agree to that. But there are some issues that are absolutely non-negotiable. There are some in which only clarity matters. We can't be confused at all. Things like forgiveness and the glory of Christ are issues like that. And so John says, that's why I'm so direct. But this morning, I want to move on. And there's one more reason why John writes so directly. And that is for the purpose of calm children or to calm the children. I want you to look at verses 13 and 14. I'm writing to you fathers because you know him who has been from the beginning. I am writing to you young men because you have overcome the evil one. I have written to you children because you know the father. I have written to you fathers because you know him who has been from the beginning. I have written to you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the evil one. Now, I will admit, if it's the first time you've ever read that passage, if you read it this morning for the first time, there's probably a question mark that circles in your mind to say, what in the world is John talking about? It doesn't necessarily become clear to us initially, and that's sort of the way John writes. What he says is extremely clear. He just doesn't always tell you everything. You don't always realize what's circling in the back of his mind, but when we stop and examine it a minute, I think it will come clear for you. John is very simply, to understand the point, very simply seeking to encourage various people in the church. That's what he's doing. Various groups, John's writing to encourage them. This is an uplifting passage. You see three groups. Now, they're not hard to see. Verse 13, the first one you run across is fathers, John says. You get a little further into verse 13. And he says, I'm writing to young men, the second group. And then the third group in verse 13, he says, are children. Verse 14, he repeats two of them. You see fathers again, and you see young men again. So you get now that there are three distinct groups in which John is referencing. But you also need to understand, these are not physical groups, they're spiritual ones. When John says fathers, he's not just talking to men who have physical children. When John says young men, he's not just talking about men between the age of 18 and 30. And when John says children, he's not just talking about little kids. These are spiritual analogies. This is a spiritual picture. When John talks about fathers, he's talking about the most spiritually mature. That could be men or women of really any age. It's just the spiritually mature. And when John talks about young men, this would be the next level down in the spiritual growth. And again, it can be women, it can be men. He's just talking about levels of growth. And then children would, of course, be new believers, new converts, babes in Christ, we would call them. And so when you read this, don't read fathers as though this is a Father's Day passage and we're just talking about men who have children or young men is only for men and John didn't really care about young women. That has nothing to do with what he's saying. He's just breaking this down into levels of spiritual growth and spiritual maturity. So understand that first. All of you, whether male or female, and regardless of your age, if you are redeemed, fit in one of these three categories. We're all in here at various levels. And so we understand that. But let's talk about them for a second. We're going to start with what we would call that first level of growth. We're going to call them the susceptible. The susceptible. And for that, we're talking about children. You see it in verse 13 at the end. John says, I have written to you children because you know the Father. Children, babes in Christ, new believers. Um, it can be, by the way, and there is some biblical precedent when we talk about children or these most immature in the faith, it can be those who have been saved for a long time but just refuse to grow. In the Bible, that is reality. Those who, for whatever reason, have not sought to mature, have not grown and the Bible does point them out from time to time. In Hebrews 5, we read concerning him, and there the writer is talking about Melchizedek. We have much to say. He says, it is hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing, for though by this time you ought to be teachers, you have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God, and you've come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness, for he is an infant but solid food is for the mature who, because of practice, have their senses trained to discern good and evil. The writer of Hebrews there is actually talking to perhaps grown adults or people who have been Christians for a long time. They just never got off the milk. 
They, they never grew up. They, they never matured in the faith. He says, you ought to be teaching other people, but, but you've never done the work. You, you don't know anything about the truth. You don't have any surety of doctrine. You don't know anything about theology, and so you really can't teach anybody anything because you haven't grown. And the writer of Hebrews sort of rebukes them for that. When Paul wrote to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 3, he said, And I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual men, but as to men of flesh, as to infants in Christ. I gave you milk to drink, not solid food, for you were not yet able to receive it. Indeed, even now you are not yet able. And so there is a precedent for saying that when we talk about children, it could be someone who's been saved for many years, they just never grew. They, they never took the discipline to study the word of God. Maybe they were sporadic in attendance to church, and so they never sat under the preaching of the word of God. Uh, maybe they never really got into Sunday school or Sunday nights or Wednesday nights, and they just never feasted on God's word. And the entire scope of their life consists maybe of a passage or two here or there, once or twice a month or a few times a year. And so they just never spend any time in the word, and the reality is they just don't know anything. It doesn't mean they're lost, they just never grew. And that, that's a reality in Scripture. But I do want to sort of set the mind at ease here to say John has no hint of a rebuke in what he writes. There's nothing in this passage to which John looks at children in the faith and would rebuke them for being children in the faith. That is a reality, but it's not used here. John's not necessarily trying to get on to those who are new believers. John's not necessarily trying to rebuke those who are babes in Christ Really, John is more or less just pointing out that that's a reality. In a church, when you look around, there are new believers. There are new converts. Now, they may be a six- or seven-year-old kid, and they may be a 65-year-old adult, but they're new believers. They are spiritual children. They are babes in Christ. And John here talks about them. He says, I have written to you, children, because you know the Father. It's a pretty wonderful reality. They're babes in Christ. They're newly converted. They do not have a handle on the deep things of theology. They do not have concepts of doctrine. They can't take election or predestination like Leo sang about in the song and explain any of it to you. They don't have a concept of the deep realities of grace. They're not going to grasp the sovereignty of God. They don't know a lot of the depth of doctrine or depth of theology But they do know one thing. What do they know? They know the Father, right? They know the Father. They know God. Think about an actual infant or a child for a second. Uh, Think about Cooper, Cheyenne's little boy. Cooper probably doesn't know that Derek's a fireman. He has no idea what Derek does when he goes to work. He doesn't know what he does when he runs and hangs out with Ronnie, but for that matter, neither does Marcella or Cheyenne. He doesn't understand why his dad goes to work. He doesn't understand why his dad does a lot of the things that he does. He doesn't know much about his dad. He probably doesn't know much about Derek's interest, couldn't tell you his favorite food, doesn't tell you what kind of music he likes. There's probably a whole lot about Derek that Cooper can't tell you. But what does Cooper know about Derek? He's dad, right? That's dad. I know that. I don't have a full understanding of all doctrine and theology. That would be a child in the faith. They can't tell you everything there is to know about the Father. They're really limited in their understanding of who he is. But what they do know is who he is. He's God. He is their dad. And by the way, everybody starts there. Everybody starts there. You don't get saved as a spiritual adult. And I don't care how long you've been in church, and I don't care how educated you are in the world, I don't care how fluent you are in languages and smart and intellectual and whatnot, when you got saved, you came as a babe in Christ. Because everything you knew of God before salvation was distorted and wrong. You didn't have the capacity or the ability in your own mind to grasp the things of God. The only time you ever began to know God at all was the moment you were saved and God put his spirit in you. And for the first time, you were able to recognize rightly your father. And you didn't know much about him. Everybody starts there. They're all new converts. They're spiritual babes. And what would John's point be then for writing to spiritual babes except for the fact that they are susceptible, aren't they? If somebody comes in here and starts flinging bullets in this place, everybody knows you put the children down, right? You get the, they're, they're the weakest. They're the most frail. They're the ones you have to protect. 
they're susceptible. Are they valuable? Yeah. Just because they're children, we don't say, well, they're, you know, it's not like they're mature. They're just kids, right? No, we don't do that. They're valuable to us. They're important, but we recognize they are children. That's why when we have business meeting tonight, we're, we're not going to ask the kids to get together and give us their input on how to run the church, right? Because they're kids. They don't know everything yet. Valuable? Sure. Loved by God? Yes. But they don't know everything. They're children. John knows that these are the ones who are in the greatest danger of being deceived. These are the ones who are in the greatest danger of being led astray. Like an actual baby, their discerning mechanism isn't fully operational yet. I mean, you leave a kid to their own devices and they'll either poison themselves or sugar themselves to death in the matter of a few months, right? Because they can't discern. That's, that's why you've got to lock the cabinet door. You don't let them get to the Drano. That's why you put those cursed plastic plugs all over your house, right? So that nobody else can use them either, right? Th- that's why you do that, because kids aren't discerning. They don't know yet. Well, so it is here. They're believers. They're redeemed. But they're not ready yet to handle the full-blown deceptions of Gnosticism. They're not ready yet to handle these these visions and dreams and higher intimate knowledge that the Gnostics claim to have. They don't know what to do with that. They're not ready to handle all of that yet. They are children. And so John recognizes these are the susceptible. Now, I do think it's important, by the way, if, if there is a literary tool being utilized here by John, John mentions fathers twice and he mentions young men twice, but he only mentions children once. And yet... He sandwiches them in between. And if there is a word picture, I think there's a word picture of protection here. That he's got these children. And and again, not literal children, but new believers. And they are surrounded and they are protected by these young men and by the fathers. But you understand, in the church, there are always children, new believers, babes in Christ. We move on to the second group. We're going to call them the soldiers. The soldiers, these are the young men. You see them in verse 13, they're in the middle of the verse, that second sentence. He says, I'm writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. You see them again in verse 14, that second sentence. I have written to you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the evil one. This is that next step in spiritual growth. These are the soldiers. They've moved beyond the milk. They they don't just drink milk anymore like the infants. They have decided to eat on the meat of the word. They have developed their theology. They have begun to solidify their doctrine. They have studied and they have grasped the realities of the gospel. And they are the ones who are now beginning to put that knowledge and that understanding to use on the battlefield. They challenge heresy. They challenge false assumptions. They war for the truth. They know what is right, and so they battle for what is right. This is that progression in growth. I'll give you some examples of a man like this in Scripture. This is very much how Paul viewed Timothy. 1 Timothy 1, As I urged you upon my departure from Macedonia, remain on at Ephesus so that you may instruct certain men not to teach strange doctrines, nor to pay attention to myths and endless genealogies which give rise to mere speculation rather than furthering the administration of God which is by faith. That's Paul telling the young man, go, you know what is true, now fight the battle, Timothy. In 1 Timothy 1.18, he says, This command I entrust to you, Timothy, my son, in accordance with the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you fight the good fight, keeping faith in a good conscience, which some have rejected and suffered shipwreck in regard to their faith. Among these are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have handed over to Satan so that they will be taught not to blaspheme. Timothy, you've got two problems here. You've got some men with some heresy, and you need to go direct it. You need to confront it. First Timothy 4, he tells him, prescribe and teach these things. Let no one look down on your youthfulness, but rather in speech, conduct, love, faith, and purity. Show yourself an example for those who believe. Until I come, give attention to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation and teaching. Do not neglect the spiritual gift within you, which was bestowed on you through prophetic utterance with the laying on of hands by the presbytery. Take pains with these things. Be absorbed in them so that your progress will be evident to all. Pay close attention to yourself and to your teaching. Persevere in these things, for as you do this, you will ensure salvation both for yourself and And for those who hear you, it's again, Timothy, you know the truth. Now go fight for it. In 2 Timothy 1, he says, The hardworking farmer ought to be the first to receive his share of the crops. 
Consider what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, descendant of David, according to my gospel. Go fight, Timothy. 2 Timothy 2. You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. The things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, and trust these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Suffer hardship with me as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No soldier in active service entangles himself in the affairs of everyday life so that he may please the one who enlisted him as a soldier. Also, if anyone competes as an athlete, he does not win the prize unless he competes according to the rules. The hardworking farmer ought to be the first to receive his share of the crops. Consider what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. You've got to fight, Timothy. Now, you don't take children and say, come on, get out there. You're a new believer. You just got saved. Now, go teach other people. You don't, you don't tell a new believer, go out there and instruct the church. Go out there and address heresy. Go out there and confront false teachers. You don't tell a new child that, right? They just now believed in Christ. They're on the milk and they have to be trained and taught. But there comes the point where they grow in the grace and tr- knowledge of the truth. They grow in their doctrine. They grow in their theology. And they very much are expected to do that. You have to go out and battle enemies. You have to go out and fight for the truth. This is them. John says they are strong, and the word of God abides in them. Why? Because they've put it in them. They've studied it. They are filled with the words of Christ. They've read the Bible. The word of Christ richly dwells within them. They know the truth. They preach the truth. They defend the truth. They war for the truth. This is that next level of spiritual growth. Those infants, they're born again, and they're born into the kingdom, and they enter fellowship with the Father. But then they begin to eat the meat of the word. And they learn about who the Father is. And they grow in the grace and knowledge of the truth. They become soldiers. They move from being susceptible to soldiers. These are the young men. And then there's a third group John mentions. And this is the strong. The strong. You see them in verse 13. I am writing to you fathers because you know him who has been from the beginning. Verse 14. I have written to you fathers because you know him who has been from the beginning. Both times they're described the same way. A little different knowledge than the child has. The child knows the father. He knows who God is. But the mature, the spiritual father, it's different. They know him as the sovereign. The one who has been from the beginning. You might say that the child knows who God is. You might say that that young man, thanks to his study, knows about God. But this father knows God. I mean, he has walked with God. There is more than a knowledge thing here. Excuse me. (coughs) There is an experiential thing going on here. He knows him who is from the beginning. He's not the slightest bit derailed by distortions anymore. Gnosticism has never once caused him to waver at all. When someone walked in and uttered what was heresy, it did not cause him to question his salvation. It did not cause him to question whether he was wrong about God. He knows who God is. He has walked with God. He has studied God. He is not you know, waved here and there anymore by every wind of doctrine. He knows the truth. He has walked in the truth. He has been with God. He has knowledge of God. When I read and think about passages like that. I think about men like R.C. Sproul, or perhaps many of you have read Oswald Chambers, and you get this reality of a depth and a maturity of men who don't just have their doctrine right, but they just know God. There is the highest level of spiritual maturity. And again, I would remind you, we're not necessarily talking here about just the senior adults of a congregation. You can be a senior adult and still be a child in the faith, Uh, You can be a mature believer and not be a senior adult. This isn't physical. These are spiritual. But you're beginning to see those sort of levels of spiritual growth. These fathers certainly started out as children. They were one day babes in Christ too. And they got off of the milk and got onto the meat and began to devour the word of God. And they began to know and to learn about God and to study the truth and to study the doctrine. But as life went on and they applied those truths and they applied those doctrines and God began to reveal himself in a deeper way. They just knew God. They're the mature. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13, 11, when I was a child, I used to speak like a child, think like a child, reason like a child. When I became a man, I did away with childish things. In 1 Peter 5, Peter said, therefore I exhort the elders among you as your fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ and a partaker also of the glory that is to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God among you. 
exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but voluntarily according to the will of God, and not for sordid gain, but with eagerness, nor yet as lording it over those allotted to your charge, but proving to be examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. This would be Peter talking to those most spiritually mature and telling them, you have an obligation to the flock. I mean, you're not going to let the children tell the fathers what to do. The fathers are going to guide the children. In 1 Timothy 3, Paul said it's a trustworthy statement. If any man aspires to the office of overseer, it's a fine work he desires to do. And then he begins to talk about characteristics of these spiritually mature. He says an overseer then must be above reproach. The husband of one wife, temperate, prudent, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not addicted to wine or pugnacious, but gentle, peaceable, free from the love of money. He must be one who manages his own household well, keeping his children under control with all dignity. But if a man does not know how to manage his own household, how will he take care of the church of God? And not a new convert, so that he will not become conceited and fall into the condemnation incurred by the devil. And he must have a good reputation with those outside the church, so that he will not fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. This would be those mature fathers. Those who have walked and known and have a conviction of who God is and their their theology is straight and things of that nature. They know God. And they know what the church is supposed to be. And they know how the church should conduct themselves. And so John here clearly identifies these three levels of spiritual maturity. He doesn't rebuke them. In fact, if anything, he unifies them. Because in verse 12, all three of those levels are bound up in the phrase little children. And if anything, John says that little children, young men and fathers alike, all share in a common forgiveness. It's not like little children are somewhat forgiven and young men are mostly forgiven and fathers are fully forgiven. That's not what he says. They're all unified. Different levels of spiritual growth, but they're all in this thing together. And so John then is writing first to reveal. And this is important. You have to know this, that we're not all on the same level in the church. And that's okay. John's revealing that. As you look around the congregation, there are children, there are young men, and there are fathers. Babes in Christ, those who are warring spiritual soldiers, and those who are the spiritual mature. And they're in every congregation, just as they are in ours. But John is also then, not only do you need to recognize that, but then John also wants to reassure each one where they're at. And this is important. This is why it's encouraging. So John's going to write, certainly to the susceptible, but he writes to reassure the susceptible. Look again at those children in verse 13. I've written to you, children, because you know the Father. This is the encouragement to them. Now, let's take a three-year-old again. And let's say that a three-year-old's at home, playing with her toys in the floor, and a strange man walks into the house, doesn't knock, doesn't do anything, just pulls up in the driveway, walks into the house, walks up to the little three-year-old and says, I'm your dad. The three-year-old is going to look at him and go, Well, you don't look like my dad, but if you say so, okay. Is that going to happen? No. What's that three-year-old going to say? No, you're not, right? In fact, pick a three-year-old this week. Go tell them to do something, and it won't take long before you'll get the infamous, you're not my daddy, right? I mean, they get it. They know who dad is, and then, by process of elimination, they know who dad is not. And that's what John is encouraging these young men with here. You have people who have infiltrated the church and they're telling you that your father is not your father. You know better than that. You know who your father is. I know you don't know everything there is to know about him. I know you can't debate him. I know you can't argue with him. But don't let him unsettle you. You know the father. You know him. He has saved you. He has placed his spirit within you. You know better than that. And that, by the way, is one of the reasons John is being so simple and direct. That's why we've called it, you know, basic Christianity or Christianity 101 over and over. John says, you know your father. Your father dwells in light. You know that, right? You know that. You don't don't have to be a theologian to know God dwells in unapproachable light. You know your father is holy, right? I mean, that's not new. That's not deep. You know he's holy, and if somebody comes up and acts like your father's not holy, well, you know they're not talking about your father. Do you know your father is love? Yeah, you know that. If somebody's not walking in love, well, you know they're not from your father. I mean, you know this. You can see how John's trying to reassure those susceptible children. Don't let someone walking in darkness act like they know your father. 
Don't let someone living in sin act like they're in fellowship with your father. And don't let someone who doesn't love tell you that they're from your father. You know better. You know the father. It's to encourage them not to be so easily confused. He would also write to the strong. And this is to reaffirm the strong. Look at it in 14 again, there at the end. I've written to you, young men, because you are strong. Or this is to the soldiers. You are strong, and the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the evil one. Well, this is a great statement. He tells them, you are strong. Now, you have a soldier, and he's been packing that, you know, that weighted pack on his back, 50, 60 pounds, and he's humping through the mud, right? And he's carrying his weaponry, and he's fighting, and they have, a, they have an agenda. They have, to, they have to charge this hill, and they have to go down that embankment, or they have to hike many miles and then engage the enemy in battle. And what does every soldier begin to feel first? Fatigue, right? I don't think I can do this. And, and what's the commander doing right there? You can do this. You can do this, right? You're strong. You can do this. That's what John's going to say later. Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. You can do this. You're strong. Don't give up in the battle. He tells them this. The word of God abides in you. I love that. That's my favorite aspect of this. You know what he's telling them? You're right. That's reassuring, isn't it? Do you want a soldier? on the battlefield, and you've told him, I need you to hike the next 12 miles up hills, down into valleys, through a river, and engage the enemy in battle. But you need to know this, our cause and our purpose is totally wrong. Is that the way you encourage a soldier? No, he has to believe in what he's fighting for, doesn't he? He has to know that what he's doing is right. You can't go out there and engage the enemy in battle if you don't know you're right. If your cause isn't just if your truth is distorted. And so John takes these soldiers and says, listen, young men, you can do this and you are right. The word of God abides in you. How many times has John said about the deceivers that the truth is not in them? Over and over he said that, didn't he? They're lying. The truth is not in them. They're deceived. They're wrong. You're right. He's encouraging them, keep fighting the battle. Keep fighting. You're right. They're wrong. And he says, you have overcome the evil one. What does that mean? You're winning. You're winning. It may feel like you're losing. It may feel like deception is growing greater and on the rise now more than ever imaginable. Sometimes if you look around the world or you spend too much time on social media, you watch the news, it, well, it feels like that. It feels like deception and lies are everywhere. And, and sometimes we feel like we're fighting back a tidal wave with a teaspoon. And then what it feels like in the church? We're preaching the gospel and we're preaching the truth and God, it, just, it just feels like we're losing ground all the time. Can I, can I tell you something, church? You are not. We are winning. You say, winning? How can you say we're winning? Immorality's on an all-time high. There's all sorts of you know, sexual gay pride parades goes on. The world wants to adopt socialism. I mean, we, how can you say we're winning? Because we're winning. We're winning. Jesus said the gates of hell will not prevail against us, didn't he? Didn't he say we overcome? Didn't he say we win this thing? Are you to suppose that God has chosen to save some that all of a sudden they're not being saved? No. We are pressing forward. Don't read the paper and find out if the church is winning. Read the Bible. We're winning. And that's what John's telling these soldiers. You're overcoming. By the way, that word overcome is nikeo. It's where we get our word for Nike. If you wear those shoes. It means to conquer or to prevail. That's what John's telling these soldiers. Listen, we're winning the battle. You are strong, you are right, and you are winning. That's encouraging, isn't it? When you go out and fight the enemy and you battle these Gnostics or you battle the deceptions of our day and you take the truth of God and you pound it against the enemy, sometimes it doesn't feel like you're winning, but you are. In Romans sixteen twenty, Paul says, The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus be with you. In 1 John 4, 4, you are from God, little children, and have overcome them because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. When you're constantly fighting battles, constantly being hit with debate and opposing arguments, it can be easy to second guess. John wrote this letter not only to reassure those susceptible children, but to reaffirm those soldiers, to let them know, keep going. Think about, think about John now, just for a chapter and a half. 
Let's say you're one of these soldiers that you would say, this is my level of spiritual maturity. I think I've moved past the milk. I do think that I have understood some doctrine and theology, and I I do view myself on the front lines. I I do battle for the truth. I do share the gospel. I do refute error. I do confront false teaching and heresy. I I think this this is where I'm at. I would say that I am a soldier. I am one of those young men. Well, if you are one of those young men and you've gone into the world and you've confronted a sinner... You know how the backlash feels for that, don't you? It's not pleasant. Uh, Sinners don't typically appreciate being confronted. Darkness hates the light. What is even more grievous is that oftentimes when you go out and you confront a sinner with the gospel, someone who proclaims Christianity or proclaims to love God will actually blindside you and hit you from the back. You're confronting the, the enemy of darkness and a supposed brother hits you in the back of the head with a club. Because they think you were wrong to confront sin, or they think you were wrong to confront error, or that wasn't very loving. And before long, sometimes it can feel like you're getting hit from all sides. And you wonder, well, should I be going out and confronting sin? Should I be going out and preaching repentance? Should I be going out saying Jesus is the only way? Should I be declaring the gospel? I mean, it kind of feels like maybe I shouldn't. But then you open this letter of 1 John. And you open the envelope and you pull out the letter. And John, in bold, clear, emphatic terms, says, if they walk in darkness, they're lying. They don't know the truth. If they don't obey Christ, they're a liar. They're not saved. If they hate their brother, the truth is not in them. And what does that do for you? It builds you up, doesn't it? I'm not wrong. I'm I'm not wrong. They, They can all come and hit you with a club and beat you and harass you and slander you because you've preached the truth. But John's on my side. He's, it's encouraging. And, and if, I'm, if I'm the soldier, I don't want John writing some mealy mouth, beat around the bush letter. Well, you guys that are out there fighting, confronting sin, well, you know, you've got to be careful how you do it. You could be right, but you don't want to, I mean, I don't want a letter like that from John. If he's encouraging me to go out and continue fight for the gospel, I don't want some letter where I feel like he's ripping the rug right out from under me. I want him to stand up there and say, go get him, Rory, right? That's what I want. Is that what he wrote? That's exactly what 1 John is, isn't it? You say, why are you so bold, John? Because I've got soldiers in the battlefield who are fighting this battle and they need to know they're right. They need to know. John writes an emphatic letter because he's reaffirming those soldiers. He's also writing to remind the strong. He's writing to those fathers. And twice he says the same thing. Because you know him who is from the beginning. Now, what's John reminding them of? Of everybody in your church, if anybody is responsible for knowing what is right and knowing what is wrong, who is? You are, right? The elders, these old men, the spiritually mature. You cannot, you cannot leave it to somebody else to be this re-encouraging, this reaffirming voice. You know. You should be reassuring the children like I'm doing. You should be reaffirming the soldiers like I'm doing. You cannot just sit back. If you're one of the spiritually mature and you know, you cannot let these children get confused by false teaching. John should not have had to write the letter. You should be doing it. You should be coming beside those children who are confused by the Gnostics, who are confused by the heresy, and you come beside them and say, hey, you know that's not true. You know your father. And that young man that's out on the front lines and he's battling and he's bewildered and he's being hit, you should be coming beside him saying, you are right, keep fighting, keep going. That's your job now. And so John now is sort of encouraging these strong, these spiritually mature, don't just sit back. You've got to go and encourage those children. You've got to go and encourage those soldiers that are getting attacked for the gospel. That's why John is writing so bold. He's not only strengthening the children, He's not only strengthening the soldiers, but he's giving an example to the spiritually mature. I'm loving this letter, and I'm loving the boldness of John. Uh, The church has sort of bought the deception that somehow boldness was sinful. I I don't think it is. John certainly didn't think so, and if you read enough of Jesus, you'll find out he didn't think so either. There are calls for clarity. There's a call to be direct. There's a call to state what is true in a true way. Uh, That's what has to happen. And that's what John's doing. This church is at war. And he understands at a war there are all kinds of casualties. So he's got to run into the room and he's got to pick up those little children. They're scared. 
I mean, bombshells have been dropping and they're confused. They don't know which way's up. And he's gathering all those little children together, as it were, in the hallway. And he's reminding them of what they know. And he takes those children and they go out in the hall and they sing, Jesus loves me, right? You know the Father. You know who you are. That's what you do with the little children, isn't it? And then he runs back into the room and there's the soldiers and they're fighting. And he goes and encourages them and says, you're right, you're right. Keep fighting. Push. Drive forward. You're doing it. And then he goes and he grabs those spiritually mature, the, maybe they would be the generals if you want to see it that way. And he says, guys, get out there and encourage those kids. Get in there and encourage those soldiers. We are at war. This is what the church has to do. This letter is for the benefit of the church. And so let me just give us a blueprint here. I, you don't, don't raise your hand, I don't want to know, but where are you on that spiritual maturity chart you you can answer that for your own mind and and like i said john's not trying to rebuke you for where you are there's not a hint of rebuke in here he does not get mad at the children for being children so there is no shame in where you identify yourself but but it is important to know which one you are so you know where you're headed next but where are you on this chart what we would call a babe in christ you have been saved you have been redeemed you do know the father but you don't know a lot about him theology is not filled in doctrine isn't squared away you're not ready to take on the enemy you're not ready you know to debate or fight the battle and that's okay that's where you're at you're one of those little children well what do you do well first of all you know the father you cling to the father right I mean, that's what a child does isn't it uh, if you're walking through a dangerous zone you're gonna be right there on your father's leg right just watch how cooper grabs cheyenne when they leave church uh, that's how you do it right you get in your father's hip pocket And that's what a child does. You need to cling to your father. But as you cling to your father, you know what's going to happen. You're going to grow in the grace and knowledge of the truth, right? Grow. Get to know your father. You can't be a child forever. We're not Peter Pans here. We have to grow up, right? We're not going to be a child forever. And whether you're 7 or whether you're 70, if you're a child, then start growing. Get near to your father. Grow in the grace and knowledge of the truth of your father. Get in the word and begin to line out and make clear some of these truths about who he is. Because the day may come when you are called to fight the battle. And so grow. Just like every child grows. That's what they do. Like weeds, I'm told. Right? They just grow. So if you're a child in the faith, that's okay. Everybody starts there. But don't stay there. Grow. Grow into that soldier. Are you one of those soldiers on the front lines? And you say, yeah, I think that's where I'm at. I think I'm, I'm one of those. Well, keep fighting. You are strong. And you are doing what's right. And you are winning. Do not let the enemy discourage you. Do not feel like this is a losing effort. We don't, we, we don't lose. We win. And, and it's not even close. We win. Keep fighting. Keep pushing. Keep striving forward. It's okay to engage the enemy. It's okay to expose false doctrine. It's okay to expose heresy. It's okay to boldly and confidently call sin black, hell hot, judgment sure. It's okay. John does it. You can do that. Be a soldier. Go forward. But don't be a soldier trembling in the bushes. If you know the truth, if you have your doctrine, if you know the theology, if you've put the word of God in your heart and you know what is true, do not cower in the hedges. You can't. You have got to go out and fight the battle. You have got to do this. By this time, the writer of Hebrews said, you ought to be teachers. You've got to be. There's no call for any of us to just say, well, I'm just going to be a a second string punter in the church. We, We don't get to do that, right? We're all in the battle. We all have to do this. So go forward. And are you a spiritual father? You say, you know, I don't want to be arrogant or anything of that nature, but yeah, preacher, I think that's who I am. I, I know what is true and I've walked with God and I'm not shaken by these heresies anymore in my life. I've, I've reached a level of spiritual maturity. I, that's me. I know it's me. Then take what you know to be true about God and what do you do with it? You go encourage the children and you go encourage the soldiers, right? I mean, the church is the pillar and support of the truth. And if you are the spiritually mature that are in the church, then by all means, the church needs you. They need you for clarity. They need you to do what John is doing. What what the church doesn't need are spiritually mature people who are too hesitant or too confused or too scared to be, you know, dogmatic about what is true. I'm not saying be cruel. I'm not saying be mean. The Bible's clear. Speak the truth in love. But 
Boy, John is a great example of what a spiritually mature person ought to be to the church. He is not going to let the children get confused. He is not going to let the soldiers uh, get discouraged. These spiritually mature are going to go forward and encourage them. So help make the gospel clear. If that's you, if you're one of these fathers, help clarify the gospel. Quit blurring the lines. Quit softening the truth. If it's sin, call it sin. John does. Bring clarity to the church. If it's a fruit of salvation, then say it's a fruit of salvation. Don't hem-haw around it for the sake of being liked by a lost man. The gospel demands clarity. This is how a church at war is to function in and of herself, within herself. And that explains to you, if you've wondered, why John is so direct. There is a a war being fought. And there are casualties being suffered. And John is doing his part to make sure that confusion is gone and encouragement is given. And those who are in the church do what they're called to do. And I, I hope you find that encouraging. I certainly do as well. But let us just take example from him. And wherever you're at in this spiritual growth ladder find out where you're at and do what you're called to do that that's really the implication of the text let's pray father we come to you because you are god and we praise you because you are worthy of such things and we thank you again for the clarity of your word perhaps this morning we thank you for the boldness of your word like we've never thought thanked you for it before we see why it's so necessary to be so clear and so direct and so bold there are things that cannot be that we cannot be confused about. There are things that we cannot be hesitant about. And Lord God, it's my prayer that this morning that through your word, you would comfort those infants in Christ, those who are new believers, who've been saved and all of a sudden this world springs upon them. I pray that you would comfort them and give them assurance that they are forgiven and that they know the Father. And I pray God for the soldiers, those young men of the text who are clarified in the truth and now they're fighting battles for you and they're on the front lines i pray that you would encourage them that they would know they are strong and they are right and they are winning and that they are enlisted for you and that greater is he that is in them than he that is in the world lord i pray that you would encourage them in such a way and i pray for those spiritually mature in our congregation those spiritual fathers that they also would be overwhelmed with a sense of responsibility uh, to expose what is false and also to encourage new believers and to encourage those who are fighting battles that we might, as the Bible says, iron sharpens iron and one man sharpen another and that we might corporately grow into the body that we are called to be. And Lord God, this church might function healthy in the midst of an evil age and we might function right in our encouragement and our fellowship and our understanding of how we enact with one another. And, And Lord, I also pray that each of us, no matter where we are, that we would continue to grow. Well, Lord, that you would remove sort of that complacent and apathetic and stagnant spirit that can latch itself to us, but that we would realize we have yet to plumb the depths of who you are. We have yet to know you fully. Even the most mature among us has so much of you yet to be known. And Lord, I pray that you would guide us all to grow in your truth. Lord, we thank you for your encouragement. We thank you for the blessing of the truth. We thank you for what you do in the midst of your church. Most of all, we thank you for forgiveness, and we thank you for Jesus, and it's in his name I pray, amen.